Did you know Cheez-Its are made by Kellogg's? Huh. Welcome back to Talking Dragon Age, the show where I talk about Dragon Age. Today we're looking at the denizens of the Fade, spirits and demons. In most cultures of Thetis, the common idea of the denizens of the Fade are either benevolent in the case of spirits, or malevolent in the case of demons. Solus, a leading expert on spirits and demons, explains that these descriptions are overly simplistic, and that more accurate descriptors would be aggressive or unaggressive. Non-aggressive? Many demons are not interested in hurting people. We just don't see them because they're not interested in hurting people. Meanwhile, spirits embodying something generally seen as good, such as valor, may seek a fight to prove themselves. We can argue whether that makes them a demon at that point, but that's exactly what Solus is saying. Aggressive or non-aggressive. Not good or evil. Spirits want to join the living, but demons are that wish gone wrong. As Cole describes it, spirits and demons pick something they like, an emotion, concept, stuff like that, and they stick to it. They come to embody it, in a way. It becomes their whole being. Though more powerful spirits may develop more personality. Smaller, undeveloped spirits are called wisps, and are not developed enough to have latched onto something, and don't have much of a personality beyond curiosity. Wisps, interestingly, are not able to manipulate the environment of the Fade, nor mimic images they see in the minds of mortals. Wisp wraiths are believed to be the remains of spirits that have been destroyed. Meanwhile, shades are thought to be the true form of demons that have worked their way into the world without possessing a host. I'm unclear what makes these demons appear this way, while rage, despair, fear, and more do not appear as shades. It has been speculated that the shades may believe they are still in the Fade, and so that may explain why they're not taking their, quote, true demonic form. Shades are known to weaken the mortals they happen across, and some possess the ability to influence their mind right then and there. One such example is the sloth demon encountered right behind the Grand Oak in the Brazilian forest. It's worth noting that we've never seen a concrete design for a sloth demon the way we have for other types, though according to a man named Brom, the shade is the true form of sloth. It is a thing which is nearly indistinct and invisible, for such is sloth's nature. It stalks and hides, unaware, and when confronted, it sows fatigue and apathy. This makes perfect sense, but I'm hesitant to say that all shades we encounter are sloth demons. That doesn't seem right to me. Now, in-universe, Brahm was an enchanter who developed Brahm's scale for classifying how intelligent and powerful spirits are. Let's talk about that for a minute. At the bottom of his scale, we have rage demons that are the least intelligent and most prone to violent outbursts. Next are demons of hunger. In a living host, they often become cannibals and vampires, and within the dead, they feed upon the living. Theirs are the powers of draining, both life force and mana. Next are demons of sloth, which are believed to be the first on Brahm's scale capable of true intelligence. Following them are demons of desire, who are among the most powerful demons in existence, and are among the most likely to actively seek out the living and make deals that are usually tipped in the favor of the demon. At the top of the scale are pride demons, and reading directly from the Codex entry, these are the most feared creatures to loose upon the world. Masters of magic and in possession of vast intellect, they are the true schemers. It is they who seek most strongly to possess mages, and will bring other demons across the veil in numbers to achieve their ends. Although what that might be has never been discovered. A greater pride demon brought across the veil would threaten the entire world. Now, all this is said in the Codex entry for demonic possession, but it's phrased in a way that just explains the nature of demons that might seek an interest in possession. It seems to plainly state if it's talking about a possessed creature, and not just the demon itself. And now that we've gone over Brahm's scale, we're going to go ahead and throw that out the window, because Brahm doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Now, why do I say Brahm doesn't know what he's talking about? Well, because there's much more nuance to demons than he includes on this scale. This is a real danger of scientific research, where we take research notes as doctrine and remain closed off to new ideas that disagree. And it seems this is true in Dragon Age as well. Because we have seen intelligent rage and hunger demons, 
and we have seen immensely powerful pride demons that have not destroyed the world. Honestly, even now, I don't know what Hybris here was actually doing. David Gator was asked why pride is the strongest demon, and here's what he had to say. The hierarchy itself is a construct of human observers, and nothing that the demons themselves abide by. There is room for nuance among the demons. You could, for instance, encounter a powerful rage demon focused on retribution, a very powerful and complex motivation beyond simple anger. On the flip side, you could find a much less powerful desire demon that focused simply on lust. The more complex the demon's domain, the more psychic, quote, territory it possesses in the Fade, and thus the more powerful it becomes. There are also some demonic groups that haven't been placed on that hierarchy, such as fear, despair, envy, and remorse. Uh, these are often looked on as subgroups of the other types, but the demons themselves would likely disagree with such an assessment. They're a territorial bunch. Now, I have some thoughts about this. And instead of referring to the almighty Gator, I'm just going to go ahead and blame it all on Brom. I was under the impression that demons were as powerful as the concept they embodied. For spirits, faith and hope are the most powerful. I assumed that was because faith and hope are incredibly powerful concepts. Same with pride and desire. But it turns out that demons' power comes from the complexity of what they embody. Demons of lust being less powerful than retribution. No. No, I am not going to accept this. I have decided that the writers are wrong. This is my channel, I can do that here. Let's talk about the specific types of demons and a discrepancy in their behavior I have noticed. See, pride demons are proud. Rage demons are angry. Vengeance demons are vengeful. Envy demons are envious. We don't know about despair demons, but we do know that the nightmare, the fear demon, is not fearful. It is scary. Desire demons are similar. They don't appear lustful for power, wealth, or anything else. They foster that in others, and their form is based on the concept of desire. But they don't exhibit the traits associated with desire, the way pride demons exhibit pride or rage demons exhibit rage. This is weird to me, because rage demons do encourage rage in mortals, and pride demons encourage pride in them. Desire demons encourage desire. Fear demons encourage fear through horror. And the Nightmare Demon was extremely powerful, drawing primarily on fears related to the Blight. And here's why I disagree with the writers. Is that really complex? More so than lust or rage? Lust is exceptionally powerful. Lust gives way to a variety of addictions. Lust can destroy lives. Lust is primal, much like fear. Meanwhile, the desire for wealth and power, a lot of the time, I'd even say most of the time, that desire is born of envy. Money and influence are only valued because some have more than others. Envy demons appear to be more personal, like being envious of a particular person as opposed to just the rich or the powerful. Other times, the desire for wealth and power is born of wanting to help people. Compassion. Empathy. Love. I'll come back to that. What about demons of hunger? People that are hungry desire sustenance. And when satisfied, this can give way to gluttony. So would gluttony be embodied by a hunger demon, or a desire demon, or a pride demon? Because we get the wealthy and powerful eating more than their share simply because they have access to it. What I'm saying here is that there is more nuanced demons than meets the eye, and they can't be easily classified the way Brahm wants them to be. And a demon's power can't just be the more complex a concept is, because we see that primal ideas are more powerful than ones that arise from circumstance. Now, there is a... S oh my god, trucks, stop it! Stop it! No, stop! Stop existing! Oh my god! Freaking, it's 11.15. Why, why are there so many trucks driving by my house? Now, there is a spirit and a demon that for some reason aren't talked about much, if at all. And I'd argue that the concepts are both naturally the most powerful by far, and the most complex. 
Love and Hatred Love is complex. Love cannot be easily defined. The closest we have is 1 Corinthians 13.1. Love is arguably the most powerful force in the world. The things we would do for what and who we love exceed anything we would do for any other reason. And the opposite of love, hatred. Hatred is nigh impossible to explain. Hatred is a stain on your soul. And only if you have ever truly hated something or someone do you fully understand what that means. Hatred is complex. Hatred is naturally powerful. Dragon Age claims spirits of faith and hope are the most powerful spirits, while demons of pride and desire are the most powerful demons. I say spirits of love and demons of hate exceed them all by far. Now, spirits and demons can change their nature. Spirits can become demons by being denied their original purpose, or being changed by something drastic, such as trauma. Yeah, keep the trucks coming. Keep them coming. Yeah, that's okay. That's sarcasm, by the way. Do not do not keep the trucks coming. The spirit of justice the warden commander meets in Amaranthine is twisted into a demon of vengeance when it joins with Anders and is corrupted by his anger at the Chantry and Templars. Solus's friend, a spirit of wisdom, is corrupted into a pride demon by mages who are trying to bind it to fight for them. Yeah, imagine hearing that when you're trying to uh, record a video. Yeah, that's what I'm dealing with just constantly right now. It's the sound of trucks, by the way. Despair demons are said to be corrupted spirits of compassion, but I think that's an oversimplification. Seriously? Seriously? But I think that's an oversimplification. It's speculated that the nightmare demons started helping people by making them forget their worst fears, but eventually just came to embody people's fears and gained power from them. Without feeling those fears itself, mind you. So yeah, I'd say a spirit of compassion can become a demon of fear or despair, depending on its nature and what it is that twists it. A spirit of valor can become a demon of rage or maybe anguish, if that's a thing. Despair is an interesting demon because despair is literally the complete absence of hope. Sorrow is not the same thing. Sorrow is what I feel when a thousand trucks are driving by my house while I'm trying to record! But, like Inside Out teaches us, sadness can be good. Despair is what happens when we lose all hope, and that cannot be good. Or at least, it can't be healthy. Meanwhile, we get demons of terror and fear. And the thing about them is, terror is the fear of something about to happen, while horror is the fear of something that is happening. For example, being attacked by a tiger is horror. Thinking a tiger is stalking you is terror. So that's that. Uh, there are a lot of spirits and demons we haven't seen, but we have heard of. Codex entries talk about spirits of courage and joy. I don't recall any mentions of demons or spirits of sorrow, but I'm certain they exist. A demon of regret or remorse is seen in Tevinter Nights, as well as a demon of hunger that created werewolves. The Lady of the Forest is an interesting example of a spirit we don't know the name of. She could be a spirit of compassion, given how she treats the wolves, but she also helped Zathrian enact revenge when he created the curse in the first place, which makes me think she may be a spirit of justice. She may be a spirit that deals in anguish, drawn initially by Zathrian's anguish and inflicting it upon those responsible, now healing the anguish of those afflicted by their actions, which may be why she agrees to slaughter Zathrian's clan despite knowing that will prevent the curse from ever being cured. That was always weird to me, but maybe anguish is the reason behind it. Either that or justice is my theory. We see a spirit of command. Uh, the pride demon known as Hybris supposedly holds a piece of everyone who was ever a ruler. The rock wraith we speak to during the Deep Roads expedition is a demon of hunger that possessed an existing rock wraith, which is believed to have once been a dwarf. 
Hakon is an interesting spirit or demon that I think embodies war, and you can learn more about that in my episode for the Avar and Chastened. The Forbidden Ones are four demons that are supposedly the most powerful in existence, though three of them can be defeated by our three main heroes. But I'm guessing they were just banished back to the Fade and reformed, since even the ancient elves couldn't defeat them permanently. And yeah, I think that's about it. This episode was kind of a mess. To recap... Trucks keep driving by my window the entire time I'm trying to record this, but I bet as soon as I'm done, they're all gonna stop. To recap, some spirits are generally more powerful than others, but it's flexible. No one type of spirit or demon is always more powerful than another type of spirit or demon. The only potential exceptions being love and hate, but that is not confirmed. There's a lot of nuance to demons and spirits, and trying to nail down some concrete rules for them is pretty much impossible. From their power levels to how they get their power to the manner in which they embody concepts, nothing is certain 100% of the time. Brahms' scale is a bunch of nonsense. It would be like saying deer have strong hind legs, therefore frogs are deer. Okay, it's not exactly the same, but you get the point. Before I go, I want to give a special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon, Ren Harrell, Girl Tries Games, Lev Sabin, and Katie Louise. Thank you guys so much, it really means the world to me. So that's it for now, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to comment and like, and remember, Tala, not us. And trucks suck. I mean, not all the time, just when they're, you know, driving by my house when I'm trying to record a video. Okay, bye!